11 miles to target. Confirm. Yeah, that checks looks good. One okay. minute. Starting the attack sequence. Roger. We've got 540 ground speed. You can put that up a bit. I've got barrel IN. Okay, I've got low loft selected. Okay. Ready for symbology. Target symbology is in. Target slightly left. Okay, stand by. Radar's on. Correcting slightly left as well. Okay, I've got it. It's a good mark. I'm correcting slightly right. Hello again everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video I'm certainly very excited to be giving you an early access look at the Just Flight Avro Vulcan. The aircraft will shortly be available to purchase for Microsoft Flight Simulator and once again Just Flight have been kind enough to reach out asking whether or not I would like to showcase the aircraft to you ahead of release. This is an add-on which I've very much been looking forward to personally so I jumped at the opportunity. I've already previously purchased the Just Flight Vulcan for both P3D and X-Plane 11 so, as you can tell, it's an aircraft which I certainly have a little bit of a soft spot for, and I've never been disappointed with the product previously. The Microsoft Flight Simulator version of the aircraft is obviously a radical overhaul though from the previous iterations of the product. And during today's video, as ever, I endeavour to show you what the add-on has to offer. As always, please do bear in mind that this is an early access version of the product that we're looking at here today. As such, certain features may still be adjusted, there may be various tweaks and bug fixes between now and the add-on to release. Nevertheless, as I think will become clear throughout the video, we are certainly on for another winner here with the Just Flight Vulcan. For our flight today, we're currently on the ground at RAF Lossamouth. We're going to be taking the Vulcan out towards the west. We're actually going to take a run down Loch Ness. As usual, it will be a full flight in the aircraft, allowing you to see the level of systems depth, the overall level of fidelity that Just Flight have brought in their recreation of this iconic machine. I certainly hope that you enjoy the video and this first look at a very special aircraft. As always, if you do, please consider giving the video a like and subscribing to the channel. So, welcome to the cockpit of the Just Flight Avro Vulcan. As discussed, we're currently on the ground at RF Lossamouth. It's a pretty windy day outside, but otherwise very pleasant conditions for a flight. As usual, Just Flight done an absolutely excellent job with the Vulcan. And a really nice level of attention to detail. I'm sure you'll agree that the aircraft certainly looks the part. I really enjoyed the product with both Prepared and x 11, so really happy to see now the Vulcan on short final for Microsoft Flight Simulator. It is worth noting here ahead of the start, we've already been back towards the AEO station. We've already got the aircraft configured electrically. That is rather out of sequence, but it's just to save us switching back and forth between the two stations. It was to run through the pre-flight checklist. With that being said, we've still got plenty of items to run, so continuing on with our checks. The ejection seat safety pins are installed. Crew oxygen supply is selected on, we do have the flow indication. Battery master is selected on, the non-essentials have been connected up to the aircraft electrical supply. We're currently being supplied by a ground power unit that's connected to the aircraft and that is visually modelled outside as you've seen. For the air brake emergency isolation switch, it's currently set through to normal and guarded. Alternators are off, the AAPP or the Airborne Auxiliary Power Plant I believe it is. It is currently started, again out of sequence here, but just to save us switching back towards the AEO station. Primary flight controls, auto stabilizers and feel are all selected off, expecting to see all of the amber lights currently. Your damper as well, they're selected off. Main warning lights are both on, we're expecting to see those, those are the two amber lights. The bomb release safety lock is set through to lock with a green light. The bomb door emergency switch is set through to normal and guarded. The AAPP bleed switch is set shut and indicating shut. The AVS master switch, a little bit buried away down here on the right hand side. That's currently set closed. It is worth noting as well, there's a fully modelled custom pilot model, which shows internally on the aircraft. Really nice to see, we'll demonstrate that later on. Just leaving him off for now so that we can set up the cockpit a little bit more freely. The 200 volt power supply again, currently being supplied by the GPU. The 115 volt transformers, again selected on here ahead of the sequence. The autopilot, we'll just bring out the centre console. We'll take the autopilot power on. I will say some of the sounds not quite as nice as they were in both prepared and X-Plane at the moment, but again this is a work in progress. So autopilot power supply selected on, we should see the 
Magnetic indicator there, illuminate wide in just a moment to show the autopilot's ready, which we now have. Ahead of time here we'll take track, out hold, we'll just preset both of those so we can just go straight to engage later on. For the MFS TFR switch, that's set through to MFS, and on the MFS mode selector we're going to come straight through to bomb. Again, slightly different from the checklist here, but that's going to allow us to use the heading select here on the gyro compass to coordinate the aircraft. The fire warning lights. First checking the engine fire warning lights. And they're all good. And for the fire warning of the bomb bay as well. Lights are checked. The low pressure fuel cocks, they are a little bit buried away. And track IR certainly comes in handy here. Forward position is open, so the LP cocks now set through to open. I have found you're actually able to actuate those at the minute with the guards closed, so again, just a slight bug there. I'm sure that'll get fixed up ahead of release. HP fuel cocks are actuated by the throttles, they're currently in the closed position. The throttle detent isolation switch is set in. Pressure selector will set through to cruise, and we can guard that up. The cabin air switches are both set through to shut. Ram air valve is shut, the temperature selector is set, cold air turbine magnetic indicator is out. External lights master switch will take on, we'll take the nav lights through to flash here ahead of the start. Tank pressurisation is off, we've got four magnetic indicators all showing white. And that's corrected versus the prepared version of the aircraft, previously they used to show a black indication. So tank pressurisation is set off, air to air refuelling panel is selected off. The fuel pumps again down to the centre console, we're just going to take all 14 pumps on here ahead of time. Absolute raft of fuel pumps here on the Vulcan. And we can configure the rest of the fuel panel later on. The engine and airframe anti-icing is currently selected off. For the engine start is going to be a normal start, so the air selector switch is set through to normal. We do have external ground air at the moment. Ignition switch is selected on. The engine master switch is selected on. The air cross feed magnetic indicator is indicating open. We're expecting to see that. And again starting via the external air so throttles will leave in the idle position. The engine air switch will just take the number one. We'll be starting the number one engine first. It's recommended to start the number one or the number four first, that way you can cross bleed the start should you so wish, but we're going to be starting all four engines here with the external cart. Number one engine air switch is selected on. We'll hit the number one starter. Just left the crew hatch open at the moment so you can hear the start sounds a little bit better. The start itself, the oil pressure is rising. We're looking for a jet pipe temperature below 700 degrees during the start. Just wait until we come up through 20% here on the RPM. And there's 20%, so the HP fuel cock can go on. Through 22%, we should see the start light extinguished, which we have. And just monitoring that JPT now as the engine runs up. So as you can see, the JPT doesn't get particularly high during the start. I don't know whether or not that's accurate. Only up to around... 280 degrees there, no point if we get even close to 700. The oil pressure, that looks good. We'll start the number two, I'll just stay quiet for the number two start. That way you can hear the startup sounds in their entirety. So again, switching over to the number two engine air switch and we'll hit the starter. Okay, so we have a good start now on engines 1, 2 and 3, lastly just starting number 4. So we'll select the number 4 engine air switch, engaging the number 4 starter. 
And again, the engine's spooling up, just coming up through 5% there on the RPM. All pressure's coming up. That's looking good. Again, just waiting on 20%. Which we now have, so the HP fuel cock is selected on. There's our light off. And now just waiting here on the number four to stabilize. So we do have four good starts, everything looking good there across the board. We'll take the number four engine air switch off. The off start checks, the alternators are selected on. Again, we've done that here ahead of time. Engine master switch is selected off. The ignition switch is selected off. And again, the air crossfeed magnetic indicator now indicating shut. For the fuel console, we have all 14 pumps selected on. The auto manual pump selected through to auto. And the bomb main switch is set through to main. We've got no fuel tanks installed in the bomb bay of the aircraft here today. Engine air switches are all shut. The cabin air switches are both shut there as well. we'll carry out an air brake test. So first going through to the medium drag position. We do have an indication there on the magnetic indicator. And through to the high drag position. And we'll stay the air brakes once again. The light's out. The hydraulic pressure, that's checked up in the green. Bombay door operation. The door currently open. We'll make sure with the ground crew that the air is clear. We can close that up. And as you can see, the magnetic indicator there is out. We'll set that through to auto. The primary flight controls, auto stabilizers and feel. We can take all of those on now. And we'll take your damper one. So as you can see, all of the flight control systems slowly coming online. And we have all lights out as we're expecting to see. The artificial feel is selected through to normal, the lights off. According to the checklist, it should be a green light. It's an amber light here in the aircraft. Main warning lights are checked off. The flight controls will carry out a flight control check. So we have full up, full down, and neutral, full left, full right, and neutral, and on the rudder, full left, full right, and neutral. So we do have a good start, we'll have the ground crew disconnect the external power from the aircraft. We've already started up the AAPP here as previously stated. That's already online. So the aircraft is configured electrically. Just the AVS master switch to come and we can taxi out for runway 05 here at Lossamouth. Can leader 5 in Atlantic approaching Foxtrot North. Can leader 5 cross Foxtrot North, north to south after departing. Leader 5 after the departing twin cross north to south report vacated. Leader 5, thank you. Okay, so we now have ourselves lined up here on runway 05, just the before takeoff checklist left to come. The primary flight controls have been checked, the instrument flags are checked. Nav selector, again according to the checklist we want that in the central position, but we're going to leave ourselves here in bomb just to allow us to use the heading couple straight away on the autopilot. For the heading bug we've got 246 pre-selected, that's going to take us out towards Inverness. For the autopilot itself, we have the ready magnetic indicator illuminated. The electrical system is configured as required for the PFC and stabiliser panel. That's checked, all lights are out. The red and amber caution and warning lights are extinguished, magnetic indicators are all checked. Hydraulic pressures are checked up in the green, the fuel console is configured here for the departure. The DI switch is set through to medium. Tank pressurisation switch, as you can see we now have our friend on board here in the right hand seat. The tank pressurisation switches are a little bit buried away behind him, but I've already pre-selected those on. For the altimeters, we have a QNH of 1023 set on both sides, so that's giving us an aerodrome elevation of around 30 feet. 
The radio altimeter is selected on. Coming air switches, we can take either the port or the starboard on. We've currently got the port here selected. And for the engine air switches, we can take either one and two or three and four. We've got one and two selected on. So let's see before takeoff checklist completes. For the takeoff and the Vulcan, we want to hold the aircraft on the brakes initially during the run-up. We'll set 80% on the engines. Once we're through 80%, we can come off the brakes. We'll come all the way through to takeoff power. And takeoff in the Vulcan is quite interesting. You actually need quite a bit of forward pressure on the stick to keep the nose down. Apparently that is true to life the real world aircraft. So part brake off again, just holding the aircraft on the brakes. Coming up on the throttles. As we do so there, you can see the fuel flow increasing. The Olympus 301s are fairly slow to respond, but I imagine that's pretty true to life for the real world engines. Certainly it was the case as well with both the P3D and the X-Plane 11 version of the aircraft. So there's 80% off the brakes, coming forward on the stick. And continuing to advance the throttles all the way through to take off power. So power's set, needing quite a bit of rudder here to keep the aircraft straight, which is nice. Definitely not overly sensitive. Up to 150 knots, so just releasing that forward pressure, and as you can see, the nose really wanting to come up with its own volition. If anything, you just need to tap back slightly on the stick to get the aircraft airborne, but in this particular case, even that wasn't really necessary. So we do have a positive climb, we'll bring the gear, we'll pitch for two five zero knots. And nicely established now here in the climb, we'll come back to 90% on the RPMs. We'll start the turn out towards the southwest. Maintaining 250 knots for now, we'll climb up to around 6,000 feet just to put some altitude between us and Inverness as we come overhead the city. And the aircraft fairly tail heavy now, so we'll start trimming forwards. The after takeoff checklist, the undercarriage is selected up, lights are out. Really nice detailing there as well, you can see on the fuel quantity indicators, the needles just bouncing up and down here in the climb. The takeoff cruise selector, we'll set that through to cruise, guard that up once again. We'll leave the landing lights on, same for the tank pressurisation. Cabin air and engine air switches are configured as required, just coming up through 5,000 feet, so 1,000 foot to go here in the climb. Anti-icing is configured as required and the bomb bay tanks once again not fitted here to the aircraft today, so we'll leave the fuel selections down on the mains. So just getting ready to level off here at 6,000. And as we do so we'll come back to around 80% now on the RPMs. So that's going to give us around 300 knots here in the cruise. So far the aircraft really nice hand flight actually. It feels pretty weighty. we will get a good demonstration of that as we run down Loch Ness. I'll throw the aircraft around a little bit, make some max deflections on the controls. It's going to be nice and easy as well to see here today what I'm doing on the controls. You can just look at the control surface deflection indicator. So it's coming through 300 on the heading. Nicely trimmed out now for 6,000 feet. We'll just hold the rest of the checklist here until we're established in the cruise on the heading. We'll get the autopilot in. Just coming through a westerly heading. And we've got the coastline down there. We should have Lossimuth just off the left wing. And Kinloss out somewhere at our 10 o'clock. So it's coming on to a heading of 246. Just come around closer to a heading of 240 just to put us straight down the Moray Firth. So 
that's a pretty beautiful view here of the inlet as we come southwest bound early evening. Okay, so nicely established on the heading. Good now in terms of trim, we'll just line up the heading bug once again. Looks like we need just a little bit more half trim here. Needing quite a lot of minor corrections, constantly having to fly the aircraft here. Not necessarily a criticism. Okay, now we've got things pretty nicely trimmed. The trim is a little bit sensitive, but that can actually be adjusted by the tablet, so that's a great option to have. So, heading bug looks good. Same there for the altitude. We'll pre-select out once again. And we can engage the autopilot. The autopilot seems to work pretty nicely overall as well. There are a couple of bugs at the moment, particularly with indicated airspeed hold, but just flight are aware of that. They said that's going to be corrected ahead of release. Just coming slightly further back on the power levers, we'll try and maintain 300 knots. And as you can see, tracking really nicely here down the Moray Firth. Again, we should have Kinloss passing just off the left wing. Kinloss has now been decommissioned, I gather, as an airbase. I think it's a uh, barracks these days. We'll just run through the after takeoff checks then. Once again, the anti ice set is required. Bombay tanks not installed for the climb checks. The oxygen is selected on with the flow indication. Altimeters are set. We're going to stay on the QNH throughout the flight. The electrical supplies are set as required. It's the climb check is complete. You can actually just see the entrance to Loch Ness now, just off our 11 o'clock. We've just got a very short hop here over the land as we come through the Moray Firth and in towards the Loch itself. Once we've passed over Inverness, we can descend the aircraft again, we'll get ourselves back down towards ground level. And we're going to make a low level run here through Loch Ness. As I say, we'll throw the aircraft around a little bit. We're going to continue out towards the southwest until we hit Fort William. We'll do a quick lap around Ben Nevis. Let's head outside and as we pass over the Moray Firth and over Inverness itself, we can take a look at the absolutely beautiful model that Just Flight have created for us. Redskin formation, your clearance will be to go to high worth low level, not above the altitude 1,500 feet and uh, your score will be 4776. Zero degrees, 10 knots. Taking off India, 5157 at Correct, slightly right. There you go, that's the right hand correction. Got it. 45 seconds, 7 miles. Weapon switch is live. Height and speed are good. It's looking good. Stand by for reheat. Ready. Reheat's coming in. Nozzles are going. Okay, so we are just approaching the entrance to Loch Ness. Just coming down through 2,000 feet here on the right out. We've still got 80% here on the RPMs, we've picked up a little bit of speed obviously here in the descent, doing about 330 knots currently. Again, we just passed over Inverness, and we'll carry out a quick check here of our fuel state before we commence our run down the lock. We've got about £3,000 there in both the number 2 and number 3 engine feed tanks, about £2,000 in number 1 and number 4. It's all up, we've got about £10,000 of fuel on board the aircraft, plenty to play around with here as we come down the lock. The Vulcan actually can be pretty manoeuvrable down at uh, low altitude and relatively low airspeed. We're probably a little bit high speed at the moment to really be chucking the aircraft around, but we'll keep the pace up for now as we come down the lock. We can start reducing that speed once we make our way out towards Ben Nevis. We should actually have a castle down here off on the right of the aircraft. I don't know whether or not that's modelled in the sim. As always though, awesome scenery here in Microsoft Flight Simulator. I often get asked why on earth you'd want to fly fast jets in the sim, or aircraft of this nature, military aircraft, I would have thought the video would speak for itself. I know we don't have the full functionality that you might see in DCS, but let's be honest, most of these military aircraft spend the vast majority of their life not in combat. I think that's probably the castle here rendered in the sim. Again, really awesome experience, such a cool aircraft having the sim, such a unique piece of design and engineering. Beautiful aircraft as well, that goes without saying. As I say, Just Fly done an absolutely excellent job with it. I'm sure that's coming across, hopefully, here in the video. 
So about a third of the way down the lock at this point. We'll keep a good eye out for Nessie as we go. Don't believe that's modelled in the sim. Off the nose you can see the lock ends out towards the southwest. We've got Fort Augustus. It's actually a little airstrip down there as well, Glenda. I think we've landed at that in a previous video. And Fort Augustus, I believe, is the golf course. I don't know whether or not that's true. I'm not a big golfer, personally. So once we've passed over Fort Augustus, again, a little bit of land to cut over and we'll be cutting into the next lock. I don't know whether or not my chart's accurate here. It says Lock Locky, which is rather amusing if that's the case. Anyway, that's a much shorter lock. We'll take that out towards the southwest again. Shortly thereafter, we'll hit Fort William. And just off to the southeast of Fort William's Ben Nevis. That's the highest mountain in Scotland. We'll do a quick lap around that. And as I say, we'll take that as an opportunity as well to throw the Vulcan around a little bit once we've bled off some of this speed. We're back down now to around 300 knots. And at the moment, the aircraft does feel pretty lumbering. That's full deflection out to the right there on the ailerons. As you can see from the flight control deflections there on the gauge, we're not getting all that much deflection on the surfaces due to our high speed. But if any of you have seen the Vulcan in any sort of air display, you'll know that the aircraft really can throw itself around with a talented pilot behind the controls. Unfortunately today we don't have one of those, but I'll try my best. Again though, just an epic experience within the sim. And all of this as well, essentially default scenery, 28 pounds for the aircraft, I don't think you can do a whole lot better than that in any sim. Okay, so just coming over Fort Augustus, we'll buzz the locals, they're not going to get the same courtesy that Inverness got. The detail is just insane, I've got a few little mods here and there, but they're all freeware. There's the uh, Glendo airstrip out on the left, we did do a flight there previously, now that I remember, we took the Savage Cub, I believe it was, out towards Glendo. So it's following the course of the river, or quite possibly I suppose this is a canal. That joins us up with the next lock. And just having such fun flying the aircraft. Again, it's very heavy, very lumbering on the controls at high speed. It doesn't feel particularly agile, but it's easy to fly. Quite stable as well now that we have things trimmed out. Or maybe stable is not even quite the right word. We're still moving around quite a bit in terms of our vertical speed. It's just very easy to put the aircraft where you like, and it feels pretty much exactly as I would have imagined a Vulcan might fly. I've got 11 miles to target. Got yeah, that. that checks. Looks good. One okay. minute. Starting the attack sequence. Roger. We've got 540 ground speed. You can put that up a bit. I've got barrel IN. Okay, I've got low loft selected. Okay. Ready for symbology. Target symbology is in. Target slightly left. Okay, stand by. Radar's on. Correcting slightly left as well. Okay, I've got it. It's a good mark. Light speed. Clocks away, 55 seconds. Weapon package looks good. Correction coming in short. We'll start going back off the throttles a little bit here then, just to reduce that speed. We'll go for around 70% on the RPM. I really love as well that just five added the custom pilot model. It looks more appropriate for the sim. It fits nicely into the cockpit as well. I'm sure the default Sobo model would have done the job, but it really just goes to show that extra level of effort. And again, just ramps up that immersion a little bit more. I imagine this would be an absolutely superb experience in VR. It's definitely one I'm going to have to try for myself. So now that we're back at low speed, you can see definitely more control authority. A little bit more deflection there as well on the elevons now by the looks of things. We've got what I believe is Ben Nevis there off in the distance. We'll go for a little bit of a wing over. So back at 250 knots. Again, the aircraft, really good fun to hand fly. I have no idea how accurate or not it is to the real world Vulcan, but it certainly feels like a unique flight model. It doesn't feel generic Microsoft Flight Simulator in the least, and there so far doesn't seem to be any particularly 
strange behaviours or weird vices from the aircraft. So all of that, of course, is really positive to see. Just keeping our bearings here, but we'll dive back down into the valley. We'll just do a little bit of low-level running through the contours here between the hills. 350 knots now, so we've got almost zero control authority. We'll take a little bit of speed brake, bleed off that speed. And again, exactly the same behaviour that I saw with both the prepared and the X-plane version of the aircraft. Some of you may have seen the video, I took the prepared version around the Mac loop some time ago, and at high speed it's almost impossible to control the Vulcan. Given that we've seen that behaviour in all three versions of the aircraft, I would imagine it's probably pretty true to life. Again, really unique flight model, really interesting to fly. We'll have a little bit more fun once we're back overhead at Lossamouth. We're going to make a low-level approach. For now, though, we'll get the aircraft back home. We've still got plenty of fuel on board, but we'll make our way back towards Lossamouth. And I'll give you some more nice extended shots of the Vulcan inner element as we come back over the hills and inbound towards home base. Get rid of the cabin control. Make a lot quieter in here. Talon's out in the left. Ten o'clock. Spotted India now. I think that's the mast over in the one o'clock. Now the arrow's pointing me to the actual start point. And confirm that on the map. Okay. Nice into the first start point. I'm stepping up to the next point now. I'm going to designate that. And here we are in lock. Nest. Got to rock the locals off, that's for sure. And 450 knots. Pylons over through there. Clear of those. A little bit fast. Pylons on the right hand side. Okay, hey, that's a bingo fuel, I've got 5,000 for first check fuel. Let's go down into the uh, side of the lake slightly, keeping on the wood line. Right, we're ultra low flying now, we'll be down at 100 feet. Okay, so we're inbound towards Lossamouth once again, on somewhat of a long final currently for runway 05. You can see Kinloss just down there at our 11 o'clock, again, now decommissioned. Released as an airbase. We're not going to be making a fly pass today at the field, only because, according to Just Flight, they've yet to refine the fly-by sounds for the aircraft. And of course, I'm sure that's going to be something pretty special once they're finished, so we'll save that for another flight for another day. We'll probably come back and review the aircraft once it's been released. For the time being, then, running through the descent checks. The altimeters, again, we've got QNH 1023 set there on both sides. The takeoff crew selector, we'll come back through to takeoff just in case of the event of any go around. Engine air switches, once again, we've got one and two selected on. And for the cabin air switches, we've got the port switch selected through to open. The electrical panel, once again, configured by the AEO. The AAPP already started. Nav selector, we can now set back through to central. We're not going to require the autopilot for any further parts of our manoeuvring here today. We'll start reducing speed here as well now, so we want the approach to be back at around 180 knots. Once we've got the aircraft slowed up, we can also start taking a little bit of speed brake, just to help control the speed a little bit more, make the aircraft a bit more speed stable. We'll run through most of our before landing items here ahead of time, just to help with the workload. So the undercarriage will leave for now. Brakes are checked and off, hydraulics look good. Hang lights are selected on, engine air switches are all selected off. So Kinloss just down on the left. And we're coming back in for runway 05 at Lossmouth. Speed just coming back through to 30 knots. We'll just maneuver slightly further out towards the east.
Not yet visual with the runway, but I can see the airfield itself. Looks like we're currently paralleling runway 10 more or less, which makes sense. And speed now back at 200 knots, so looking good. There's runway 05, so we'll turn in. And back off the throttles, getting that speed back towards 180. We'll take the speed brake back through to the medium drag position. And of course now we're going to need quite a bit more power as a result to maintain 180 knots. So it's rolling out final for runway 05. Even with that drag actually still needing a fairly low power setting here, we do have a pretty high descent rate. We are a little bit high currently. Take the gear as well, that's going to help us a little bit in terms of drag, so gear down. Just waiting on three greens. Final approach, we want 160 knots. Gears check, we do have three green lights. And we want to come over the threshold around 140. Once we touch down, we can deploy the drag chute below 135. So looking good now in terms of speed, good in terms of configuration. In terms of fuel, we've got about 1,500 there on number one and four, 2,000 pounds on number two and three. Just coming up again on the throttles to maintain 160. Looks like that wind swung around a little bit. We've got a bit of a crosswind now out from the right. As you can see, a fair amount of crab here to keep the aircraft tracking down the runway centre line. So we'll touch down, we'll lower the nose gently onto the runway. Again, once we'll blow 135 knots, we'll take the drag chute. And then we can just start gently breaking down towards 60 knots. We'll vacate down at the departure end of the runway, off to the left. So just walking that speed back now towards 140. The aircraft feels like it wants to sit at 140 anyway. We are pretty light here today. We've got no munitions on board and a fairly low fuel state now as you've seen. Still got four whites around the Pappy. So we'll just correct ourselves in terms of the vertical profile. Still pretty happy though with where we're looking in terms of the touchdown zone. So we'll just keep ourselves perhaps slightly high on the Pappy. And luckily for us that wind's swinging around a little bit again, turning into more of a headwind. The aircraft feels really good to fly as well actually in the approach configuration, which is certainly a vast improvement over the P3D version. That was a really tricky machine to land. Okay, so cutting throttles, we do have a little bit of a crosswind looking at that windsock. So a little bit of left rudder there is touched down, having to decrab the aircraft. Below 135 knots, we'll take the drag chute. And down through 100 knots, lowering the nose onto the runway. Actually having to push forward on the stick there of anything. And as I say, we can start gently coming onto the brakes to vacate down at the end. Okay, so we made our way back in towards stand. I thought we'd save the offline checks here till we're parked up, just make things a little bit easier to run through. So the brake chute has been jettisoned, anti-ice is selected off, engine air switches are all shut, tank pressurisation switches are selected off, de-ice switch is set through to low, 
The number three alternator and the AAPP have been selected off. PFC and auto stabilizers will take off. Same for the your damper. Now we'll take the artificial field off there as well. Air brakes are selected in. Auto manual switches. We'll leave those in auto. They should go through to manual, but it's not really going to be relevant for flight today. Autopilot power is selected off. Radio altimeter is selected off. Alternators number one and four. Again, we'll leave those to the AEO. The HP Philcox will take the number one and four off. Interesting that we shut down the number one and four, given that the number one and four are the first to start for the cross bleed. The fuel pumps, we should leave one running per engine, but it's going to be a shutdown here, so we'll just take all of those off in a moment's time. Ejection seat safety pins are installed. Nice little feature there as well. Not the first aircraft in the sim, but one of few that has that. The shutdown itself, the part brake is set. Auxiliary rudder is selected off. Bombay doors will set through to open once again. Engine master switch is selected off, landing lamps are retracted, DI switches are selected off, entrance door has been opened the 115 volt transformers, 28 volt TRUs again we'll leave to the AEO so for the last two HP Philcox, the number two and three those are selected off, fuel pumps again 14 fuel pumps to work our way through Those are selected off. External lighting. Take the nav lights off once again. External lighting master can go off. Alternators are set. Pressure head heaters. Are selected off. We don't want to guard that up. Engine air switches. Are all shut. Cabin air switches. Both set closed. AVS master switch. Is set closed. The trucks are in position. And the battery master will hold. That is the shutdown check is complete. Back on the ground in Lossamouth. So there you go guys. I do hope you enjoyed our first outing in the Just Flight Avro Vulcan. Once again, please do bear in mind that this is an early access look at the product. And as such, we're not looking to review the aircraft here today. Once again, there will be certain features that are adjusted and bugs that are fixed up between now and release. Further issues that just like themselves state still need to be addressed include the fuel consumption on the aircraft, currently it's rather high. The autopilot also needs a few tweaks, same for the engine flight idle model. So again, there are still a few adjustments to be made within the next week or so, but I think as you can see throughout the flight, overall the Vulcan is a very solid product. Without a doubt though, the Vulcan is right up there with the rest of Just Flight's in-house lineup. A visually stunning recreation of the Vulcan, an aircraft with high levels of systems fidelity, the sound set as well recorded from the real world aircraft and the flight model whilst once again very difficult to judge versus the real world airframe certainly very unique, very different from your average aircraft within the sim. The Vulcan also comes with a number of additional features including an onboard tablet with Simbrief and Navigraph integration. The airframe is very customizable in terms of configuration, there's also visibly modelled weapons available. The product also ships with an excellent manual and the aircraft is also relatively FPS friendly. I was losing around 20 frames, getting around 60 FPS in the Vulcan versus around 80 FPS in the default Cessna 152. Time permitting, we'll almost certainly be back to take another look at the aircraft once it's released. But ultimately, £28 for a beautiful recreation of this iconic and interesting machine. As I mentioned during the introduction, I've owned both the P3D and the X-Plane 11 versions of the aircraft. I've no doubt I'll be adding the Microsoft Flight Simulator version of the aircraft to my virtual hangar as well. Once again, a very big thank you to Just Flight for letting us take an early access look at the aircraft. And thank you to all of you as well for watching the video. I do hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, then please consider giving it a like. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, then please do consider subscribing as well. And if you would like to help support the channel further, you can do so by becoming a channel member or patron. I'll leave a link to both of those down in the video description below. I do hope you're having a great day wherever you are. Take really good care and I will see you all again soon.